was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget his benefits. Who forgives you all of your sins? Who heals you of all your diseases? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let us begin with our call to worship. In joy, we gather this day. In remembrance, we gather this day. In festive celebration and quiet reflection, we gather to worship and pray. Hosanna to the Son of God. Let us pray. Jesus, you have walked this road with us many times. Guide our steps and keep us close. Inspire our worship with your loving presence and work in our lives that your spirit may flow through our lives as we seek to help others walk the journey with you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Oh, oh be joyful in the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Sure that the Lord He is God. We are His people. We are His people and the sheep. Oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving. <clears throat> Be ye thankful unto him. For the Lord is gracious. And his truth endureth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning. Is now, is now and ever shall be yes. world without end.
Amen. Ah, amen. As we remain standing for the hymn of praise, there is a fountain. Is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt. Whose all their guilty say, lose all their guilty stain, and sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief, the dying thief, rejoice to see that fountain in his And shout 
Good morning. These are announcements for Sunday, March 24, 2024. Holy Week begins this week. As we journey to the cross, we meet again on Monday, Thursday. Our in-person worship service begins properly at 7 p.m. We look forward to seeing you. Our Good Friday service featuring the seven last words will be on Friday, March 28th at 10 a.m. sharp. Please stay on time and in place for service to begin. We request very limited to no movement during the service, so we ask that you please arrive by 9.30 a.m. so that we can assist you in getting comfortably seated. And then we have Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, March 31st. We celebrate our risen King and worship the living Savior. Join us in person as our praise and worship begins promptly at 10.30 a.m. and our call to worship at 11 a.m. We look forward to seeing you. All services will be in person and live streamed on YouTube and Facebook. So send I you, commissional organization founded by our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Joe A. Bruce Sr. will host the final Lenten Dialogue series on June this evening. Please join us at 7 p.m. The meeting ID and passcode are 84255. Three three seven one two seven. The passcode is one four seven two nine two. To dial in for access and to call in by phone, you can call six four six five five eight eight six five six. The meeting ID and passcode are the same. The Lengths and Series prayer call will culminate this Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. sharp. On this final call for the Menton season, we will pray for our missionaries on the continent of Africa. Please call into the Daily Prayer Line to join us for this final call. The Daily Prayer Line number is 2678. Zero seven nine six zero five, and the access code is five one two one two five pound. The WKB Brown Brick Project, in partnership with Silsin Dayu, is now accepting all brick orders through March 30th. Please note the deadline for all WKB Brown Brick orders is March 30th. 2024. Brick information and order forms are now available in the church office. For any questions, please see Deacon Marie Cunningham for further assistance. We are saddened to announce the passing of Sister Ann Myers, a long-standing member of our community of faith here at the Walker Memorial Baptist Church. Homegoing services are incomplete at this time. We will advise you as we receive news from the family. The homegoing services for our beloved Deacon Errol Hill will be on Wednesday, March 27th. Wake and viewing is from 4 to 7 p.m. Doodle service was, will begin promptly at 7 p.m. Let us be sure to keep our bereaved brothers and sisters in our prayers. Tamela and Quentin Kars and the Hill family at large, Sister Sharon Hart and family, Sister Karen Forbes, Sister Laura Brown, the Myers family, our sick and shut-in community at large, Deacon Johnny Gripper, Miss Ruby Williamson, Sister Williams, Brother Noel Washington, and our international community of brothers and sisters that continue to suffer at the hands of evil, living in the political and conflicted war and final ravaged nations of Kenya, Haiti, Myanmar, Russia, Malawi, Taiwan, China, Ukraine, Moldova, Iran, the Congo, Luanda, Australia, and the United States of America. Good morning, beloved. 
In addition to the prayer concerns that you have already heard this morning, may we remember the people of God and the body of Christ at the St. Peter's Baptist Church in Margate, South Africa, along with the um, Mackey family in Margate, South Africa, and the National Baptist Convention or National Baptist Churches of South Africa, who lost their pastor, their president of the National Convention, uh, Dr. Christopher Mackey. Some of you remember Dr. Mackey, the father of Caesar Mackey. Caesar has been here several times, young Caesar Mackey while a student at, uh, at uh, American Baptist College in Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Mackey passed away suddenly this past Monday uh, while attending a prayer meeting, in fact. He passed away. What a wonderful way to go, attending a prayer meeting. And um, the St. Peter's Baptist Church in two locations in Margate, have lost their leader. We lift them up in prayer. Dr. Mackey was moderator of the oldest Black Baptist Convention on the continent of Africa and the largest with hundreds of churches in South Africa, in Eswatini, Swaziland, in Madagascar, and in Lesotho. And I would that you pray for all of them as this came as a shock to them, as this came as a shock to me. I spoke to him on Monday before he passed by telephone and he was perfectly fine, laughing and talking and getting ready for my June visit with him and his convention. Uh, and I hung up the phone from talking with him at 8.05 a.m. his time in South Africa. And by four o'clock, when my plane landed here at John F. Kennedy, he had taken his flight. Pray for me. I'm headed there today uh, to eulogize him. And we'll be back next week. Uh, but I want you to lift them up in your prayers. I double dare you to remember and pray deeply for the crisis uh, in Palestine today. The Israeli Prime Minister has announced his intentions to go into Rafah and do the same damage in Rafah. Mine now, 31,000 are already dead in Gaza. He now plans to go into Rafah and has made it clear he's willing to do so even without the blessings of the United States. Washington has finally realized that this is a monster who cannot be controlled. And he is bent on destroying the Palestinian people, two million of them. He knows he has the blessings of much of the church in the Western world. Christian people, especially in the United States and in Europe, he knows that. And he firmly believes that he can continue with their support, even if he wipes out a whole generation of Palestinian people. On this Palm Sunday, I ask you to remember all who suffer politically, all who suffer because of the meanness and madness and viciousness, the vileness, the hatred of other people. They're not just in Palestine now. They are everywhere. They are in Haiti. They are across the globe. They suffer because someone else has more military might and power than they do, or more weapons than they do, or more rockets, more planes, more missiles. Can you believe that? 
that the world will watch a people with no weapons and no army to defend themselves. Leash rockets and missiles and drones and uh, tanks on a people who don't have one single tank, not a single airplane, not a rocket of any kind do they have. But the world must stand aside and watch the military might that you pay for. You Americans, you sitting under the sound of my voice, you pay for those rockets and missiles to the tune of 10 to $12 billion a year to fund the murder and the genocide of these people. And I may be the only one to say it, but I must say it. God is not pleased with what we are currently witnessing. And he's not happy with the position that the church has taken. And he's taken. God is angry at the church. And it may be one of the reasons why the church is on the decline around the world. The church doesn't know what to take a stand for and what to stand against. I would that you today lift up these people, the families that you've heard in our own congregation, the families whose names have been called in our own congregation this morning. Would you lift them up in your prayers? And uh, keep in mind the families, the Myers family and the Hill family, the Kars family, they are in need of our prayers. And the Lord will bless you. All of you, my father's children, who have brought here today your prayer needs and concerns, whatever they are, you need to know that if they concern you, they are of concern to God. God is concerned about it. If, if it bothers you, it concerns him. If it worries you, it concerns him. Now, it may not worry him, but he's concerned about you and your issue, your problem, your dilemma, your crisis, your situation, whatever it is, you can rest assured that God is concerned about you and he welcomes your bringing to this prayer place this morning your prayer needs and concerns. Our prayer hymn this morning, we ask that you join us in singing it, lifting your voices. Yet no friend is 
so high and holy no the Holy Week, let us not be remiss and not be in prayer as we journey to the crucifixion. Um, let us relax our minds and prepare our hearts as we go before the throne. Wondrous God, King of glory, how amazing it is to be able to come into your presence. You made a way for us to do so. You thought of it all. Indeed, you are the complete God, the possessor of grace and mercy, the possessor of deep, abiding love. A love that allows for forgiveness. A love that gives us a second chance. And another chance. And another chance. Power and might is in your hands. Yes, you are righteous in all ways and holy in all works. Lord, we honor you today. We magnify your name because you are the God above gods. There is no God above you, Lord. So we thank you this morning that we're able to come into your presence. And we do so in the name of the one who said, I will be with you always, Jesus your Christ. Thank you, God, that you wrapped yourself in human flesh. You came down here to show us the way, to give us a path to salvation. You saved us, Lord. For that we say thank you. You sent us a man called Jesus, the one who goes into our places of personal failure, the one who forgives us, the one who wipes our slate clean, the one who gives us a new beginning, and the one you must go through to get to the eternal God. We thank you for waking us up today. This is a day we've never seen before, regardless of the temperature outside and what is going on. We are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. What a great reason to come to this house today so that we can be with you and commune with you in baptism today. Lord, we just thank you that there's spiritual growth in this place. We thank you for this house and the angel of this house who keeps things running. He's working hard in the garden. So we thank you for him, keep him well and keep him in your will. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, the technology that we heard this morning. We have, met, we have food, we have transportation, we have shelter. Lord, we have much, we have our, each other, we have ourselves, we have you most of all. And yet, as much as we are blessed, we wake up to a dangerous world, a hot spot in the Middle East, Lord, carnage, 
Lord, only divine wisdom can deal with that. Man shows his frailty, his vulnerability. He cannot do it. We are not self-sufficient. We are battered. We are torn. We are beat down, messed up from the floor up. We cannot make it without you. We must have you in our lives. And Lord, no matter what is going on, whether it is civil wars, drug wars, gang wars, whether people are in the hospital or in nursing homes or in rehab centers, whether they are an oppressed woman somewhere in this world, whether there are violations of innocent children, whether they are thieves, even in this house, Lord, we thank you that you are the answer to it all. You've got everything covered. You are complete, God. You can cure whatever ails us. So we thank you that the power and the might lies with you. We thank you that you are a God of comfort. We can come to you for strength. We need it, Lord. We're in a messed up place. We live in a wretched world. Sin abounds, but grace abounds more. So we thank you, and we say hallelujah to Jesus today, our Lord and Savior, the one who abides with us, the one who is the light of the world. We thank you, God, that you can cure whatever ails us. You can perform miracles. You can raise people from the dead. You can do it all. And so this is why we are here today, to speak well of your name, the great name, the one that is all and in all. We thank you. Cleanse us today. Cleanse us in baptism. Cleanse us in self and sin. Fill us with hope and the will to win. And so we submit this prayer of adoration and intercession and petition to you in the victorious and the matchless name of the one who is the lily of the garden. We thank you for Jesus, your Christ. And so we submit it in his mighty and precious name. Amen, amen, and amen. And now, beloved, it's time for us to make preparation for the sacred rite of water baptism. It'll work itself out. It's here somewhere. <laughs> They're here somewhere. Uh, it's time now to make ourselves ready for the rite of Christian baptism. This is when we, in obedience to the teachings of the Lord Christ, take to the baptism of waters, those persons who have publicly professed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have indicated that they are ready to take refuge under what God has done for the world through Jesus Christ as it relates for their eternal salvation. In other words, the church takes to the water those persons who have declared that their only hope of eternal life, the only hope they have of seeing God face to face is through the finished work of Jesus Christ done at Calvary. And it has been the tradition of the church to require such profession of faith and then to instruct and prepare the candidates for baptism. Now, baptism by water does not save anybody. Nobody is ever saved because they get baptized. 
it's going to be a whole lot of saved people or baptized people in hell. And it's going to be a whole lot of unbaptized people in heaven because people misunderstand what baptism is. Baptism does not save you. Doesn't have the power to save. It's just water. It's an act of obedience. It's done because Jesus has commanded it to be done. And his followers submit to his commands. That's number one. And it is also done, and more importantly, as a symbol. It is a public announcement. It is a public statement. That's why it's done publicly. So that your family and your friends, the candidates, so that their family and friends um, will get a picture of their commitment to this new call upon their lives, a new fresh call on their lives. This event symbolizes their death, the death of these candidates. They are dying. They are signifying that they are dying to an old way of life. They are signifying by being buried in water. That's what it is. It's a liquid grave. They are buried in water to signify that they have a newfound faith, a newfound purpose for living. They have new goals, new objectives, and they're signifying their identification with Jesus Christ who died and was buried. And they will be raised out of the water. They'll only be in their second. And this is a picture of their resurrection. It is a picture of their coming up out of the liquid grave rising to a new life and a new way of living. It's a public event. And they've called their family and friends together to share in this event because this is a, uh, a testimony to them that they have anchored their faith firmly in the work of God through Jesus Christ done at Calvary. Jesus commanded the church, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And the pastor has made it clear that this is not anything. Uh, they are, this is, this does not mean that they've been saved. It only means that they are acting in, on their faith. They are being obedient. Baptism doesn't save you. Y'all got that in your mind now. And now the church justifies her existence in the world only as she seeks the salvation and redemption of other people. The church justifies her existence in society only as the church seeks the salvation and redemption of other people. The Lord has blessed us to have these persons this morning to come for water baptism. We have received their uh, confidence from their own lips that they believe in Jesus Christ. And today we will add them by water baptism. And then we will give them the right hand of fellowship today signifying that they have all rights and all privileges, but also all duties and responsibilities of the church. They become responsible for helping this church to be the church, to bear witness, to proclaim the love and the uniqueness of God in Jesus Christ. So this membership comes with privilege and with duty and responsibility. We are obeying the Lord now. Baptize them in the name of the Father, 
in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let us give God thanks now for what God has done and is doing. Lord, your word has gone forth, and as you promise, it has not gone forth without returning unto you and bringing with it that which you have ordained it to bring. Thank you for the opportunity to serve in your kingdom. Thank you for the souls that have been added to the kingdom through the ministry of this, the Walker Memorial Baptist Church of the Bronx, New York. Thank you for those who have responded to the call for those who have said yes to your will and to your ways. And now we, the church, pause to celebrate their birth into the body of Christ, to celebrate their being added to the kingdom of God. We pause in obedience to celebrate what you are doing through the Spirit, continuing to add to the church daily, those that would be saved. Now may this visible testimony to the world touch and reach those who are witnessing this and remind us all of the need to take care of spiritual business. In the name of Lord Christ we pray. Amen. You may bring the candidates forward please.
in obedience to Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, and upon your profession of faith in him as Lord and Savior. My dear sister, in obedience to Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, and upon your profession of faith in him as Lord and Savior, I baptize you, Shatona, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. My dear brother, in obedience to Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, and upon your confession of faith in him as Lord and Savior, I baptize you, Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. My dear brother, in obedience to Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, and upon your profession of faith in him as Lord and Savior, I baptize you, Odell, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And now, Father, we have done that which you have commanded us to do. We have full confidence that you will do what only you can do. Enable us to walk before these new converts in a manner that will bring you glory and honor. Fill them with your spirit as you promised to do. As they learn to walk and talk and fellowship with you and with the body of Christ. Now dismiss us from this pool, but never from your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
And now we'll have our offertory period.
All things come come from Thee, O Lord. of our God. Brothers and sisters, it's time to bless the palms. So we'll wait for the ushers to get in place with the palms so we can bless them on this morning. For those who know their Bibles, they know that Today is a special Sunday, if you will, in the church calendar's year. It is what is known to believers, not just Baptist folk, but believers throughout the world are celebrating on this Sunday, Palm Sunday. It is our time to recall Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. He entered into Jerusalem knowing what was lying ahead of him. He knew that although there were shouts of joy, he realized that before him was the cross. And guess what? He faced it resolutely. In other words, Jesus was determined to do everything that it took to bring about your salvation as well as my salvation. And all who would call on his name for salvation. So as he entered into that city on that day, the people cried, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. Hosanna! And um, it's interesting to note, Hosanna means save to the utmost. Hosanna, save us. I don't know about you, but there's some things we need saving from. Save us from ourselves. Save us from the oppression that seeks to hold us back. Save us, most of all, from the deadly influence of sin. Save us. And brothers and sisters, we know the report, but I don't want to jump a week ahead. But the report is he did just that. He saved us. And now... Let us pray together as we bless these palms on this morning. Precious God, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, while we were yet sinners, you were determined to set in motion, not only set in motion, but to fulfill a plan of salvation for us. And for that, we are thankful. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings, who is the Lord of lords. 
Jesus, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, on this morning, we reflect and we think about your passion. All of what you had to do to secure our salvation. We think about that day when you came into Jerusalem riding a colt. Riding on a colt. With shouts of joy and jubilation. Yes, you came in as a king, but you came in as a king of peace. Yes, and the people, they shouted and they waved palm branches and laid them before you, symbolizing that you are truly a king. But not only are you truly a king, you are the king above all kings. And so now, Lord, as we remember all of what you had to do or all of what you had to endure, we ask now in the name of Jesus Christ that you forever Make us aware. Let us never take this for granted or take it lightly. For God, you so loved us that you gave your only begotten son so that whosoever believes on you shall not perish but have eternal life. Bless these palms. They're mere, mere symbols of who you truly are. Bless them and let them be a reflection to us daily of the price you paid to attain our salvation. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. Hallelujah to you. Amen, amen, amen.
Uh, first of all, let me say this. Uh, it's good for me to be back home. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to be back home on this morning. And also, I'm, I'm elated to see this. I mean, my soul rejoices because um, we are doing what God has commanded us to do. When I come in and I see a row filled with young people, and a somewhat seasoned gentleman, I saw a seasoned gentleman as well, coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my soul rejoices. My soul rejoices. Brothers and sisters, but I have to say this. Faith has to be nurtured. This is just the beginning. It's the first act of obedience in the sense that you're making a public confession that Jesus is Lord. But that, it doesn't stop there. There's a lot more to this. It's a lifelong journey. And it's good to know, or you have to be aware, brothers and sisters, of the secrets to growing the faith. And it's, it's pretty simple. One, remain prayerful. The Bible teaches us to pray without ceasing in all matters, small and large. I would encourage you to inquire of the Lord, to see what the Lord would have you to do. And ultimately, to resign your will to God's will. One thing I've learned is God's will is the best thing going. It's the best thing going. Trust me. Our vision is just too limited. Our sight is just too short. But with God's sight, he sees all and knows all. And so I would encourage you, yes, to be prayerful. Pray without ceasing. But the other thing I would encourage you to do is Stay in the word of God. Stay in the word of God. I'm confident of this. You cannot grow as a disciple if you're not in the word of God. You have to open up the good book, as they call it. Every day and feast 
upon the bread of life. Feast upon the bread of life. Which means not only ensuring that you're in the word, but also make sure that you're amongst the fellowship of believers. Yes, it's the fellowship of believers that will help you along this journey. We can't do it alone. I guess that's why Jesus sent them out two by two to work and to support each other. And yes, Scripture teaches us, forsake not the gathering of the righteous. So that's the third thing I would recommend. Make sure that you are faithful in your attendance to worship, Bible study, and prayer meeting. At this point, Pastor has asked me to, for us to do the right hand of fellowship. So when I call you up, please come up and grab, uh, come and get the certificate, stand up front, and we'll um, welcome you to the Walker Memorial Baptist Church family. Joseph Figueroa. Naraya Hunter. Shatana Pickett. Odell Berkeley. Additionally, we have Shariah Eldridge for the right hand of fellowship. Jose Gonzalez. Amen. May Bryce. Now to all of you, my father's children, who are receiving the right hand of fellowship at the Walker Memorial Baptist Church this morning, signifying that you are full members of the Walker Memorial Baptist Church. All rights, all privilege, all duties, all responsibilities of the burden of this church are on your shoulders. You carry the burden with us. You share the burden along with us. And I want to be the first one in the Walker Memorial Church to shake your hand and officially welcome you to the body of Christ called Walker Memorial Baptist Church, Bronx, New York.
All right, now let me take a moment to do something extraordinarily special. We have a number of visitors in the house with us today, and I'm going to pause and ask you to stand wherever you are so that we can acknowledge your presence with us today in this house this morning. Look at the visitors who are with us today. Oh my goodness, this is, this is absolutely wonderful. I'm told that, uh, amen. Look at there. I'm told that Deacons Bernard and Gladys Hutchinson are in the house this morning, all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina. The parents of uh, Sister Regina, uh, who is that? Howard, all right, all right, wave your hand there. Wonderful. And we have families from the Bronx visiting with us, some of whom have relatives having been added to the body of Christ this morning, and we are thrilled to have you with us wherever you are as pastor of this church. It's my delightful privilege to reach out to you on behalf of the whole body here and say to all of you, welcome, whether you come from near or from far. We are simply... Uh, excited about having you grace our worship with your presence this morning. Now, should any of you live in the surrounding community, anywhere in the neighborhoods around us, and you are looking for a church home of your own, yes, a place like this where you can be uh, a part of our large family where we are big enough to, uh, to serve your needs and yet small enough to know you personally and in individually. We would just be thrilled to have you become a part of our family. When the invitation is extended, just simply walk down the aisles and we will welcome your coming into our midst. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and thank you for being here. Amen. Now I want to call your attention to the New Testament and the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter number 19 is where I want to take you this morning on this Palm Sunday. And while you're turning there, I'm going to um, ask you to forgive me, please. Yes, I even need forgiveness every now and then. Yes, truth be told, I need it every day, several times a day. But I need a unique forgiveness from you. In the 42 years I've been pastor of this church, I have never uh, missed a uh, Easter Sunday worship. I've always been here on Good Friday, uh, except one time. I missed one Good Friday, and I missed one Easter Sunday in 42 years. And that year, I had an, I had an accident, a car accident and wasn't feeling good about 20 some years ago on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday, I couldn't be here. And the church was able to go on without me. Well, this Sunday, Easter Sunday and Good Friday is gonna be just about the same. Now I'm not having any accidents, praise God. But when the worship is over today, I need to go to JFK and I need to take a plane to uh, uh, Durban, South Africa, where I will eulogize our key person on the ground in South Africa. Dr. Mackey was the leader of our work on the ground in South Africa. And his funeral services is being held jointly with or in conjunction with the annual gathering of the Baptist pastors from all over the region coming from Madagascar and from uh, Lesotho and from Eswatini and all over Cape Town and Durban and Johannesburg. They normally gather the week before Easter for a pre-Easter celebration. And his funeral is going to be held during that celebration to keep the people from having to double back and come back to a funeral from those regions all over. His funeral will be next Saturday, and it's impossible for me to be in two places. 
at one time. I can't make it happen. It's 10,000 miles between here and Johannesburg. And I need to be there for more than one reason. I need to be there to salute my brother who has labored so long and so faithfully, a brother who has allowed me to trust him with the resources of So Send I You, and I mean hundreds of thousands of dollars. He allowed us to trust him with the distribution of those funds as he carried on the work and led his organization to carry on the work uh, that we have sponsored right out of this church. And I cannot let uh, him go without going uh, to eulogize him as I have been asked to do by his family. So Good Friday is coming. Monday, Thursday is coming. Monday, Thursday is worship here at Walker Memorial. Usually we worship on the Thursday and the Friday before uh, Easter, Good Friday and Monday, Thursday service is Thursday evening. Thursday evening is Monday, Thursday worship. That's when we commemorate the Lord's uh, sitting down with his disciples and instituting the Lord's Supper or when we commemorate his washing the disciples' feet. The church remembers that. And then Good Friday, the service begins at 10 o'clock. I know I can trust you to be where you're supposed to be. I know you know that it's not about but one man and one man alone. It is about you and your Christ and your willingness to suffer with him. During these 40 days of Lent, we've all been suffering together. I've invited all of you to suffer with him. And that's what Good Friday is all about. It's about the passion of our Lord when we hear him for the last time speak uh, to his disciples before he goes to Calvary. The worship is at 10 a.m. Try your best to get here ahead of schedule so that you can be seated and you remember you're coming to a sacred event so we don't come in here any way. We come reverently. We come respectfully. We come to witness and execution. We come to watch God die. And so we come carefully. Uh, and of course, uh, Easter Sunday service. There is no sunrise service this year. No sunrise service this year. So you can get up and make your way to church for the regular Sunday morning worship services. I have some very capable people here, uh, the clergy persons and the lay people. Derek is here. Graves is here. Tracy may be here on Monday, Thursday, but, uh, and on Easter Sunday. But I tell you, Joyce is here. Cheryl is here. All of the deacons and trustees are here. You are accustomed to allowing me to turn my back and proving that you know how to hold this ship together and keep this ship from going under during uh, Easter season, during the Easter time. Now, I said that publicly. So those of you who are members of Walker Memorial, that's no excuse for you to say, stay home because we have a dynamic preacher Easter Sunday morning coming to this pulpit, the Reverend Dr. Derek Boykin is going to be breaking the bread of life for us on Easter Sunday. So I want you to give him your support, show him some love, and uh, carry on with the ministry as I know you are able to do. Now, this is the season when we return our 40, our uh, $60 this year for global mission work. Uh, this is the end of the journey. You are to bring your Lenten sacrificial offerings with you either next Sunday or the following Sunday. Either next Sunday or the following Sunday. You have an envelope in your devotional. Everybody got an envelope in your devotional. Do not put cash in that envelope. Write us a check or a money order. And if you're going to write a check, you can make it payable to so send I you. 
That's what you do. Make it payable to so send I you. And those of you who are listening to me by Facebook or by YouTube, I want you to listen to me carefully. The need is great. You already know that. You already know where your money is going. It's going to people who are desperately in need. And the list is all over the world. Haiti, Gaza. Uh, yes, the need is great. You can't give too much to relieve human pain and suffering. So when you come next Sunday, and the Sunday after, I'll be here the Sunday after. I will not be here Easter Sunday. I was very honest, wasn't I? And I shared with you that I need you to carry on. Be the body of Christ. Stand tall in, in my absence. And uh, it's not about making your pastor proud of you. It's about making your Christ proud of you. Stand tall and represent the ministry even when I can't be here. And the Lord is going to bless you. And you pray for us while we are making our journey 10,000 miles across the water uh, to comfort uh, my grieving people there. They are mine. You know that. I've labored for many years with these people for 40 years almost now with these people. They belong to me in a unique way. And so I ask that you keep them all in your prayers. Those of you who know Caesar, you can reach out to Caesar on Facebook uh, or, or on TikTok, whatever your connection is with him. This is Caesar's father that we are that we're talking about. Now to the Word of God. In this nineteenth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Now because I am in a somewhat of a rush to get out of here this morning, I may not get a chance to speak to you today as I must get a bite to eat before I jump on the plane. It's not healthy to go too far without nourishing yourself so that you won't get sick along the way. In the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel, And I, I want you to really read, I want you to read when you get home the whole chapter so that you can put in perspective what Palm Sunday is all about and its importance to the faith. I want you to make a commitment to reading the whole chapter, the 19th chapter. But I'm going to read into your hearing this morning just a verse or two from verse Verses 41 through 44. And here is what it says. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. It's that 41st verse that catches me this morning. It's a lot in here, a whole lot in here. But it's that 41st verse that catches me. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept. And I want to say something this morning for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Just a few minutes. I want to talk about dealing with broken dreams. 
dealing with broken dreams. Now, beloved, To be honest with you, at heart, we are all dreamers. Everybody has hopes and dreams. We dream that we will be successful. We dream that we will be loved and accepted by others. We dream of being happy, fruitful, and productive. And the journey of life to be honest, uh, is uh, the road of life, I should say, is stern with people uh, who have nothing left but the wreckage of their dreams, the brokenness of their hopes or broken hopes and aspirations. One of these days soon, I'll preach a sermon on Jesus and the broken things of life. There seem to be so many of them here and there. You know, the old darling in the retirement home whose children never come to see about her, whose children and never grandchildren who come to see her, and when they do, uh, they come looking and uh, trying to find out what's left. What's going to be mine when you are no longer here? The couple who waited for years to have a child and then were given the sad, terrible news that it is not going to happen. It just not going to happen. And if it does happen, the child has Down's syndrome and they are told that they would have to alter their dreams and adjust their expectations because this child is born with some serious limitations. The concert pianist, if you will, whose wrist was crushed in a terrible automobile accident and who was told that she'd never, ever play again. Or uh, the uh, athlete who has dreamed of winning a prize and crossing a finish line of some kind and uh, going home with a gold medal suffers a terrible accident only to render him or her incapable of pursuing that dream. Or the actor who got the big part he had always hoped for and discovered the next day that he tested positive for cancer or something of that nature and they would never be allowed. Oh! the woman or the man who has loved long and hard only to come home and have their lover tell them that I don't share your love for me. It's over. Who among us have not had big dreams? And who among us have not had our dreams every now and then crushed? It's all uh, if you want to call it the death of a salesman. That's just the way life is, isn't it? It's that way for good people and is that way for bad people? Is that way for strong people and weak people? Is that way for religious people and non-religious people alike? You can't get so much religion until you are exempt from getting your heart broken or having your dreams smashed. May I ask you today, what do you do when this happens to you? What do you do when the deal you had hoped for falls through, when the love of your life walks out and slams the door, when the house of your dreams burns down, and when you don't have any insurance to replace it, or when you find out that that child, the fruit of your wound, is addicted to drugs or alcohol? What do you do when you worked all of your life to prepare them to go off to college or university so that they can become somebody and you learn 
that they are not interested in pursuing the dreams that you have for them. What do you do when your dreams suddenly fall apart and you know there's no putting them back together again? You are forced to sing to yourself, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, had a great fall, and all the king's horses and men couldn't put him back together again. Well, now maybe it helps us to look at Jesus for a moment when he knew his dream was falling apart. That's what we get a glimpse of in this, in this 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is fully aware that his dreams are collapsing. His hopes are being dashed. That's what's happening in this passage today. The story of his so-called triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, there it is. Big crowds and uh, shouting and uh, welcoming him with palm branches, giving him somewhat a uh, ticker take parade and a reception, a royal reception, if you will, putting their garments out on the roadway, making the equivalent of a red carpet for him. And they are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest, but he knows better. He knows the politics of the time. He knows the intrigue of his enemies and the fickleness of the crowds. He knows the demonstration is only, a, it's a momentary celebration. He knows they are not for real. He knows they are fake. He knows they are phony. He knows it's superficial. He's fully aware that they are not serious at all like so many of us who come to church on Palm Sunday. Are you serious? Are you taking this seriously? And the Bible says that Jesus rides into the city and as he comes up over the hill, he sees the city of Jerusalem and when he sees it, he breaks down and he weeps. This is one of the few passages in scripture where we are told that Jesus shows uh, the capacity to weep. Now we know that the Bible says that he was human, 100% man and 100% divine all at the same time. And we are only told three times in scriptures about Jesus weeping. We are told that when Lazarus dies, if you will, when Lazarus dies, if you remember, the Bible tells us that Jesus wept when Lazarus died. They called him to the tomb and he cried. Yes, your master, your Lord, your teacher, the son of God, the savior of the world, wept like any other man with a broken heart, like any other man or woman who has ever lost a loved one or a friend, Jesus broke down and cried. And again, in the right, in the right of the, the right of the Hebrews tells us about Jesus weeping. And this is the third time in scripture we are told that Jesus weeps. Why is he weeping? Incidentally, I somewhere I stumble on the course of my reading upon something. I may have found it somewhere on Facebook or somewhere like that. That tears are without question the most expensive liquid in the world. Jesus wept coming into Jerusalem. Now he loved Jerusalem. That's what led him to weep. He loved Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the holy city of David. Jerusalem was the city of God. Jerusalem was the city where God dwelled. It was the place where the temple was. People came from all over the known world during certain seasons of the year to worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus had so much hope for Jerusalem. He had been there many times in his life. 
starting perhaps at the age of 12, the first time we're told that he was there. If you remember, he went up there for the Passover at the age of 12, and his parents lost sight of him there in Jerusalem. It was a crowded place. People were going and coming. After all, it was Passover, and people stormed into the city. By the tens of thousands, they came to worship to make their sacrifices. Jesus loved Jerusalem. He had been there many times as a lad. After that 12-year-old experience in the temple, he probably went again at 13, at 14, at 15, at 16, 17, on and on. He kept going to Jerusalem, and every time he went there, he thought of Jerusalem, that sacred place of Jehovah, where the temple dwelt, where God was expected to show up and prove himself. And he had so much hope for Jerusalem. But just like he found it 12 uh, some uh, 20 years earlier, it hadn't gotten any better. It hadn't got. This time, Jerusalem doesn't seem to be coming around. Jerusalem is not taking shape the way Jesus had it in his mind. Jerusalem is disappointing to him. Jerusalem causes him coming over that hill to break down and cry. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I read this passage of Scripture, I often ask myself, as a man who's worked in the city for 42 years, where are the men and women who will love our cities enough to weep? You don't know how often I've asked myself, is there anybody to weep for the Bronx, New York? Is there anybody to weep for Manhattan? Is there anybody to weep for Brooklyn and Queens and Staten Island? Anybody to weep for Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Chicago? Anybody to weep for Atlanta and Miami and Dallas and Houston? You know, there's a lot that goes on in the city. In the city, people are forced to live with br police brutality. In the city, people are forced very often to get into long lines to wait for government handouts. In the city, people cannot afford to pay their rent. In the city, people are often denied health care and access to quality education. Is there anybody that care enough to weep? For the city. In the city, people are shot dead going home from the grocery store. In the city, people are stabbed to death on the subway on their way home, minding their own business. In the city, people will run over you and act as if they didn't hit you, leave you to die in the streets. I wasn't born in the city, but I've worked in the city for more than 42 years. I have a passion for the city. I feel the pain and misery of people who live in the city. I know what it is to serve a people who are denied justice. I know what it is to serve a people who don't get good streets in their neighborhoods and don't get grocery, good grocery stores and can't find food at a full price in the city and I ache sometime in my heart when I see clergy persons getting everything for themselves and not thinking about the people in the city Jesus came over the hilltop saw Jerusalem and Luke says that he wept oh to God if we had some men and women in this city who knew how to weep 
especially if we had some prophets and preachers and pastors in this city who can be driven to weep. I know there are people who come up with all of that bull about a man, a strong man, don't cry. You tell them I said, take a good look at Jesus. Help me somebody. Every city is suffering from a shortage of men and women who will weep for the city, weep for the elderly, weep for the children, weep for the addicts, weep for the homeless, weep for the abused, weep. That's what uh, society is. Now when Jesus wept, he is showing um, the priestly side. Of himself, because when he went into Jerusalem, he went in as king, and he went in as priest and as prophet. He's showing the rather the prophetic side of himself. He's showing himself as a prophet. That's what he is. He's just no ordinary preacher. You know, the world is full of ordinary preachers. Nothing can touch them. Homelessness doesn't touch them. Hunger does not stop them. Child abuse does not stop them. Doesn't move them. Uh, sex trafficking doesn't move them. There are so many, but nothing moves some people. But Jesus is moved. And you ought to be glad about it. The text says that he wept. Well, now, what about me and you? When we have our moments, you know we do have them, don't you? We have, all of us have our moments, do we not? When we are forced to weep. And to weep because... Like Jesus, our dreams are falling apart. The bottom is dropping out of our bag. Like Jesus, we are disappointed in something or in somebody. Like Jesus, we are not happy with the outcome. Jesus had been going in and out of Jerusalem all these years, hoping and dreaming and praying for Jerusalem, trying his level best to get Jerusalem ready for the coming of God into their midst. He wanted them to see him as God. Uh, not just as God, but he wanted them to feel the love of God through him, to experience the grace and the mercy of God through him. And they were too busy. And it broke his heart. He comes into the city on Good Friday. Let me tell you this and I'm gone. It's going to happen to you again. Yeah, you're going to get your heart broken somewhere again. Somewhere your dreams will be uh, broken. Your hopes will be dashed. Your heart will be, uh, and you will be left like Jesus to do nothing but just stand there and cry. But how many of you know that even when you cry, that's a good exercise? Don't you try to hold back the tears now. Don't you let nobody tell you don't cry about it. Cry if you must. There's nothing wrong with crying because, you know, God gave us these eyes and these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, he, and he filled these ducts of ours with water. And every time we emptied them, he fills them back up because he knows we're going to need them. He fills them up again. Sometimes we cry out of joy and there are other times we cry out of sorrow, out of pain, out of grief, out of hurt, out of misery. It's going to happen again. You go ahead and cry. And tell the person who doesn't understand your tears to keep living long enough. And if they live long enough, life will bring them to the place where they'll do like Jesus. They'll break down and cry also. If they don't, they, it will kill them. They'll die from the inside out. Go ahead and cry. 
It's going to happen again. Secondly, I'm going to tell you that you can learn from Jesus. You do know we are followers of Jesus, don't you? You can learn from Jesus. It's a poor man or woman who walked with Jesus all his life and doesn't learn anything from Jesus. You can learn from Jesus. Didn't he say to you, come unto me, everybody who's weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm meek and lowly in the heart. My yoke he says is easy and my burdens are so light you can learn from Jesus and that may be the greatest problem in many of our churches is there are men and women who won't learn nothing from Jesus Amen. They know his name, but they will not learn how to love like Jesus, how to forgive like Jesus, how to live like Jesus, how to serve like Jesus, how to give like Jesus, how to pray, worship like Jesus. But how many of you know you can learn something from Jesus? And you can learn something about Dash Hopes from Jesus, too. I'll tell you three things you can learn from Jesus, uh, a couple of things, and I'm out of here. Although his heart was broken when he looked at a city that was determined to reject him, that was determined not to hear him, determined to pay him no mind, consider him to be way out there, as some of us do today. Although Jesus was dealing with all of that, I want you to notice how he held on to his faith. Didn't I tell you two weeks ago when I stood in this pulpit that Jesus made up his mind to go to Calvary? He made it up in his mind, Luke says in that passage I preached from two weeks ago here, that he steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem. He would not let anybody talk him out of it. His best friends came to him and said, this does not make any sense at all. Holy Ghost told me to tell somebody this morning that may be uh, headed for some weeping event in your life because the world around you is getting ready to collapse or going to collapse. Holy Ghost told me to tell you whatever you do, hold on to your faith. Don't you let go of your faith in God. It all is all you have. The writer says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things we have not yet seen. If you don't hear anything else, I have said amazing. You remember this? The old preacher said, hold on to your faith. I don't care how dark it seems or how difficult it seems. If you got a measure of faith, the size of a mustard seed, you better hold on to everything you got. This nation may be getting ready to go through some of its darkest days since, uh, since the Civil War. And many of us don't have any idea what we may be up against over the next, uh, uh, the next nine, 12 months. We don't have no idea. All evidence is that there are those who are ready, amen, to uh, let all, I'm talking all hell just may break loose in these yet to be United States of America. And I feel sorry for people who don't have any faith in anything except a man. And a man that's dying, a man, you, uh, you, you need a faith that is anchored firmly in the God, uh, in a God that you serve. And I told you all, all the time, we human beings don't make good gods. Gods with eyeglasses and contact lenses and gods with walking canes and God with sugar diabetes and God with high blood pressure. We don't make good gods. And yet, that's what some of us would do. Anchor our faith in a man as if though he's a God. And it's about to lead our nation to absolute disaster if we're not careful. So remember this, hold on to your faith. Then the second thing I need you to hold on to is hold on to your faith in the sovereignty of God. What I mean by that, I want you to hold on to the faith that matters not what happens. God is still in control. 
I wonder, can I get a witness? I know it doesn't look like it in the Gaza Strip, but God is still in control. It doesn't look like it in the Ukraine. It doesn't look like it in Haiti. But the Holy Ghost told me to tell you, God is still in control. And sometimes it doesn't look like it in my finance. It doesn't look like it in my family. It doesn't look like it in my body. But the truth be told, God is still in control. He has never abdicated the throne and he never will. He never gives up his seat on the circle of the earth as the person who is in charge of this crazy world of ours. If he did, the sun wouldn't know what time to get up if he got up at all. The moon would not know when to shine if it ever shined at all. Rainbows would never know when to arch their arms across a space, if it ever does. But because God is in control, and I don't know who I'm talking to today, but he is in control, amen. Situation looks so dark and so dim, but he's in control. You hold on to the sovereignty of God and remember that God knows what's best. How many of y'all believe that? He, he, he knows what's best. I don't know from day to day what the future holds, but God knows what's best for me. And I can rest and I can rest in the assurance of knowing that even though I don't know about tomorrow, I know who holds tomorrow. And the same one who holds tomorrow, he holds my hand. He keeps me in the palm of his hand. Nothing can move me. Nothing can shake me because I am in the care of the great I am. And thirdly, Jesus goes on to his destiny with confidence in the power and the presence of God. Yeah, it don't look good for Jesus on Palm Sunday. I wish I had a witness here. It don't look good for Jesus on Palm Sunday, but he goes on anyhow in the confidence of God's power and God's presence. He goes on anyhow. Yes, Judas is going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, but he goes on. Peter is going to deny that he knows him not once, not twice, but three times. But he goes on. All of his disciples said John are going to walk away from him and abandon him. But he goes on. Pilate will not give him a fair trial. But he goes on. The liars and the deceivers are gathering around him waiting for their moment. But he goes on. How many of you this morning are determined to go on? in the confidence of God's power and God's presence. Pastor, Pastor, how do you know that Jesus went on in the confidence of God's power and God's presence? I'll tell you how I know. I read the book. It's in the book that he went on in the knowledge of God's power and in the knowledge of God's presence. Listen what he says. When he finally gets there to the cross, they hang him there and they stretch him wide. Amen. And they drive nails in his hands and spikes in his feet. Does he have anything to say? Listen how he begins the day. He begins with, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. That was confidence in the presence of God and in the power of God. And I want you to know this morning, I don't know what the future holds for me or you, but I'm telling you, I've made up my mind. I'm going on. Yes, I am. The hills are high and the valleys are low, but I'm going on. Sometimes I feel like I can't put one foot before the other. But thank God for Jesus. I'm going on 
in the confidence that my God is present and my God is powerful and I'll go on until I cry like Jesus cries, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The door is open now. The door is open. Should there be a young man, a young woman, a boy, a girl? Oh, what a beautiful day for anybody to give their hearts to God. What a wonderful day it is for anyone to say yes to the movement of the Spirit of God. If you are here today and the Spirit of God is tugging at the coattail of your imagination, if you are here today and you have not taken refuge under the cross of Jesus Christ, if you have not anchored your faith firmly in him and his act at Calvary long ago, then I invite you to walk out of these aisles today if you're scared to walk alone, raise your hand. I'll have somebody come back there and walk you up this way. Walk with you up this way. This Christ, this weeping Christ, he wept for your soul. He cried for you and your redemption, just like he did for Jerusalem. He bled, suffered, and died to bring you into a loving relationship with God through him. The door is wide open. Even if you don't know how to believe, but you want to believe, I invite you to come down this way. We'll show you how to make the Lord Jesus your choice. One more time. As a candidate for baptism, by letter or Christian experience, welcome, welcome. Let us look to the Lord now. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And the nursery will be open next Sunday for the benefit of those of you who will be worshiping with us with young children. You are welcome to bring your children to the nursery uh, on Sunday mornings next Sunday, even Easter Sunday, it will be open for your convenience. Let us look to the Lord now that we may be dismissed. And now unto him who is perfectly able and willing to keep you from falling and make you stand completely faultless before the Father's throne. May the grace of God, our Father, the love of his Son, Jesus, who is the Christ of God, with the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, now rest, rule, and abide with each of us. Henceforth, now and forevermore, let us all say, Amen.